Hi, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today. Um, today, we will speak um, um, about, uh, we'll, we'll have chapter two of our International Law Point House Lawyers talks about the most important. My name is Olga Kushmienko. I'm head of the International Law Committee of Ukrainian Bar Association, and I am um, super happy to have everyone here, our speakers, our participants that uh, listen us online and that will listen our webinar in the recording mode. And uh, today in uh, chapter two, we will talk about uh, litigation and enforcement uh, of uh, judicial decisions abroad. Uh, we have a very esteemed panel today, and uh, I am grateful to each and uh, every speaker that we have today. Uh, they will uh, present themselves by their own. I will just outline um, the idea of our webinar, what we will be talking about today. So basically, we will uh, start with Vladislav Vandrovsky, who will uh, present the introduction of our topic. Um, what is basically, uh, which result uh, can um, you reach in litigation uh, in protection of investors' rights and uh, how to enforce uh, these uh, decisions abroad? Then Vladislav will just give us a broad overview of the topic. Uh, then we will uh, move to Yulia. Yulia will uh, Yulia Tamanova will present uh, the idea about uh, procedural issues that you may face in Ukrainian courts and will give more overview on Ukrainian uh, issues so in this um, respect. Dmitry Donenko will uh, talk about recovery of um, Russian uh, assets abroad and whether there are any Russian assets abroad. And uh, in um, uh, second the chap part of uh, our webinar, we will welcome Isabella uh, Kanata and uh, Monique Sasson, who will uh, talk about um, uh, Italian um, ICJ case and Italian experience on uh, enforcement of um, on foreign decisions abroad, including uh, all conflicts between uh, sovereign immunity, human rights, and uh, how Ukraine can uh, use this um, to enforce uh, decisions in other countries. Just a couple of organizational uh, issues. So we will um, have uh, our discussion in the following manner. I will ask the audience to post your uh, questions uh, online in our chat. Uh, I will uh, address uh, them uh, to the speakers after the speaker finishes their presentation. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, any question, just uh, make sure to write it in the chat. And in case you want a particular speaker to ask to answer this uh, question, just uh, specify this uh, in your question as well. Uh, we will try to take questions just after each speaker's presentation, but if anything, we will address all questions that we do not address during the webinar in our conclusion session. So uh, let's start. Vladislav Bandrovsky, the floor is yours. Please present you yourself much. and your presentation. Uh, allow me a second to start the presentation. Yeah. I hope you can see it, right? Excellent. <clears throat> so my name is Vladislav Vandrovsky, and uh, I will be presenting today our helicopter view understanding of uh, uh, what are the perspectives of litigating claims against Russia and enforcing them. Is it a worse mechanism or not right now? And what do we expect in the near future? I will break my presentation in two parts. The first one will be addressing litigation. The second one will talk about enforcement as such. So litigating, uh, the idea to litigate uh, war-related claims against Russia has not been born in 2022, right? Uh, human rights activists and Ukrainian government have been exploring ways to implement a compensation scheme and compensation mechanisms since uh, 2014 and the beginning of the war. 
multiple lawsuits have been brought in uh, Ukrainian courts following the aftermath uh, of annexation of Crimea and uh, occupation of uh, eastern parts of Ukraine. Uh, it would be nice to have a glance in a rare mineral uh, and us to understand uh, what uh, we have done before and what where the Ukraine was standing. So victims of war have pursued two main litigation strategies. The first one was against Ukraine itself. So claimants demanded compensation from the state budget based on a special on the terrorist legal me mechanism. And the second strategy was uh, claiming against Russia. So directly against Russian Federation based on uh, uh, civil tort procedure. The courts, however, tended to dismiss those claims due to legislative gaps, procedural hurdles, or Russia's uh, immunity from lawsuit and enforcement. Uh, analyzing the relevant case law in 2019, the Norwegian Refugee, uh, Refugee Council assessed that none of 146 cases concerning compensation for property, property damages in eastern Ukraine in, and uh, um, those cases that were instituted uh, in uh, Ukraine and before Ukrainian courts. So none of those cases has produced a decision which has been enforced. The Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union also raised similar concerns just several uh, months, half a half year before uh, the beginning of the reinvasion in February 2022. And uh, since then, calls for legal reform have multiplied and lawmakers acknowledged the victims of war lacked an uh, appropriate and effective mechanism to remedy for restitution under the existing legal regime. And uh, one of the principal obstacles that uh, the affected parties uh, regularly faced uh, was Russian sovereign immunity. So immunity against litigation, what's that? In simple words, all foreign states in Ukraine, including Russia, enjoy immunity from being sued without their consent. This rule is based is uh, uh, enshrined in national law and recognized as binding international custom. Uh, there is also this new approach, and uh, uh, the old one was well suited for a time of peace uh, when this absolute rule became, uh, and this absolute rule now became unsuitable for wartime. And thus, uh, a draft law prescribing exceptions to sovereign immunity was registered in Ukraine in mid 2022. Uh, the new approach suggests that a foreign state will not be entitled to immunity if it is sued for personal or property damage inflicted in Ukraine as a result of armed aggression and condemned by the UN General Assembly and Ukraine's parliament. The draft law also clarifies litigation procedures and uh, facilitates rules for summoning foreign states, eliminating one of the most common tactics uh, for the defendant uh, to employ in such cases. Uh, in a way, the proposed law follows the approach early adopted by the Supreme Court, which I super briefly will touch upon right now. So there was a case in April 2022 where the Supreme Court found it not it found uh, it not necessary to seek Russian consent for participation in the war-related lawsuits. The Supreme Court took into account that Verkhovna Rada recognized uh, Russia as an aggressor state and that Russian actions uh, in the in the Ukrainian territory since 24 24th of February 2022 uh, was again a site of the Ukrainian nation. However, it must be noted that the judgment arose out of the claim for compensation of moral damages caused by the death of a person. It remains to be seen whether the Supreme Court applies the same approach in claims for compensation of other types of damages suffered by both individuals uh, as well as claims uh, submitted by uh, uh, companies and legal entities. What are the inherent issues of the suggested approach? The Ukrainian constitution expressly prohibits retroactive force of law, except where it mitigates or nullifies responsibility. But clearly, this is not our case, right? Thus, lawmakers' uh, good intention to use the new law retroactively may backfire if the constitutional court were to find it unconstitutional. In uh, such an event, cases concerning the damages inflicted before the law's adoption, and this is worse. Uh, hundreds of billions of US dollars. Those claims would be excluded from the force of law and victims' uh, efforts would be 
would come to nothing. The second point and the second inherent issue is that the Supreme Court reasoning for lifts in Russian immunity falters under scrutiny. And once again, very briefly, the legal basis of this decision was customary law, which is arguably not a source of Ukrainian law, European Court of Human Rights practice, which is once again, arguably not applicable for war damages claims and discretionary interpretation of international law by uh, Ukrainian highest court. The point is, if other judges uh, follow the same approach, uh, victims might receive extremely progressive decisions with, at the same time, weak underlining reasoning, which may obstruct enforcement in foreign jurisdictions where Russia properly is located, where a Russian property is located. So this should not imply that Russia must still enjoy sovereign immunity in Ukraine there is viable alternatives that could help lift long uh, standing obstacles for pursuing Russia in national courts in compliance with domestic and international laws. Those are, uh, as uh, conquered by many practitioners and uh, uh, many academics, uh, for example, Ukraine is entitled under the UN Charter to self-defense from Russian acts of aggression. And second point would be that international treaty will, with uh, allies uh, agreeing on uh, inapplicability of sovereign immunity to Russia. And uh, such regulation might be also a part of large initiative for establishment of the International Claims Commission for Ukraine. And uh, we will discuss that in much greater details in our fourth seminar that we will have uh, in uh, February 2023. So feel free to join as well. With this, I will switch to enforcement. And um, here we have two, two basic enforcement scenarios. The first one would be to enforce in Ukraine by foreclosure on assets of the Russian Federation located in Ukraine. But the immediate issue is that given the total amount of damage caused by the war, the Russian Federation assets in Ukraine are unlikely to be enough to compensate everything. And the second point is, or the second scenario which uh, comes to help here, is enforcement abroad. So enforcement against the Russian Federation as it's located in foreign countries. Mm. Anyways, the issue of sovereign immunity against, uh, perform against enforcement persists. So Ukrainian court's decisions will not be automatically enforced abroad, as this will require a special procedure for obtaining the consent of foreign courts to recognize and enforce a Ukrainian court decision. A person seeking to enforce a judgment against Russia uh, somewhere abroad uh, must apply for a foreign court for permission to enforce this judgment. And uh, the name of the document, the type of the document, the requirements, they will differ from uh, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Enforcement of Ukrainian judgment in, foreign, in, in a foreign state is done on the basis of bilateral international uh, uh, legal aid treaties or uh, national legislation of the states with which Ukraine has not signed special agreements on this issue. And in these cases, uh, uh, the issue of execution of the court decisions is considered on the principle of reciprocity. That would be the case for Germany, France, Great Britain. A couple, a couple other jurisdictions uh, where Russia has uh, lots of assets. There is also a 2019 uh, Hague Convention on Recognition and Enforcement uh, of Judgment in Civil and Commercial Matters, which Ukraine has signed. It uh, allows for easy enforcement of court judgments uh, among contact, contracting parties. The convention enters into force uh, on 1st September 2023. And there are currently, currently 28 contracting parties to the convention who are mostly European Union member states. Importantly, the UK, US and Canada who are working on national legislation to permit confiscation of Russian assets to make them available for compensation for damages caused by the war, uh, have either not signed the convention or did not uh, clearly state when this uh, convention can be expected to uh, become part of their legislation and become binding on their territory. Uh, interestingly, neither of these instruments directly cures the immunity issue once again. So although some countries have very specific uh, exceptions. Uh, 
also enforcement rules often require that the defendant in the case should not be deprived of, of protection of their rights and proper representation during consideration of a court case, which includes timely and proper receipt of summons to court hearings and etc. This basically makes the process in Ukrainian courts very important. Why is it likely that right now judgments of Ukrainian courts will not be enforced, but we still believe that it's possible to do that later? So in most countries, states are immune to being sued as well as immune against enforcement. Such immunities are usually based on procedural law in those countries, international agreements and international customary law. To really simplify, uh, if a state may be responded in Ukraine, but not in a country of enforcement, the foreign court will probably just deny your application. So can this change? Um, an opinion is currently circulating among lawyers that courts of a country that is on good terms with the Ukraine and has Russian assets uh, could still permit enforcement. However, this uh, doesn't seem feasible unless the relevant country changes its approach to having states act as respondents in, uh, in other states' courts. Not worse, there is this uh, Germany versus Italy case that where the ICG, ICJ has uh, issued its opinion uh, on uh, sovereign immunity as well, but I guess we will address that in, further, in uh, for much greater details uh, in a couple in an hour or just 30 minutes. Well, with that, I will conclude my presentation and thank you very much. I will pass the floor to the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vladislav. Thank you for your introduction. And uh, now uh, we have one uh, question in the chat, but actually I realized that it is, um, uh, it's a very good question, but maybe it will be better to discuss it after we close the Ukrainian panel and we move to our international uh, uh, law questions. But uh, now I will pass the floor to Yulia Tamanova, the partner at LCF Law Group, member of the Ukrainian Bar International Law Committee. And Yulia will uh, talk about uh, court claims against Russia and Ukraine and abroad, about problems and uh, procedural peculiarities. Uh, Yulia, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to know that so many people uh, have joined us today. Um, please let me share my uh, screen. Um, I have a presentation uh, which I would like to follow. Let's see. Just a moment. Uh, See, so, um, I uh, will develop uh, these topics uh, which Vladislav uh, covered uh, in general, but uh, I will give some more detail. And uh, of course, the first question is uh, why we are considering the option to sue Russia in Ukraine. And uh, it is uh, really clear, uh, according to the principle uh, of international law that refers to the law of the place where the tort was committed at note, known as the rule of uh, Lex Lose Delicti Commissi. Uh, so uh, first idea, uh, which I guess uh, each Ukrainian uh, lawyers had in the beginning of the law is to uh, sue to uh, bring a claim uh, in Ukraine against Russia uh, to cover damage caused by uh, its uh, military aggression. And uh, at the same time, uh, we are we are know uh, very well that uh, as a legacy handover of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has accepted the concept uh, of state's absolute immunity, uh, sovereign immunity, I mean. Uh, thus, in theory, any claim cannot be considered and any judgment cannot be granted by the Ukrainian court against the Russian Federation. And uh, this rule uh, is introduced in uh, the law of Ukraine on international private law, just one article, uh, Article 79, um, par paragraph 1, 
uh, paragraph first, and uh, I won't uh, read it, uh, but you can see that uh, it is very short and very clear that um, any uh, foreign state cannot be sued in Ukraine uh, unless uh, its consent uh, given by the competent authorities um, or unless otherwise provided by an international treaty of Ukraine or the law of Ukraine. Uh, so uh, as a general principle, uh, we cannot uh, bring a claim against uh, any foreign state, including Russia, uh, in Ukrainian court. But at the same time, some acceptance might be uh, prescribed by the International Treaty of Ukraine or the law of Ukraine. But what is uh, interesting that Ukraine is not a party to neither uh, treaty convention on uh, state immunity, um, nor neither European uh, Convention on State Immunity, nor the uh, United Nations uh, Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and their properties. Uh, thus, as Vladislav said, several uh, legislative initiative uh, were proposed. Uh, really, now uh, there are four uh, draft laws uh, on immunity, uh, and you can see all of them uh, on the slide. And all drafts, uh, draft laws are through um, and differ um, by the following criteria in reality. Uh, so uh, all of them uh, have the same purpose to eliminate uh, the uh, sovereign uh, immunity of the Russian Federation. But on the other hand, uh, all of them uh, have has different approaches. And uh, they differ, for example, um, which legal act is proposed to amend or to pass as a new act. Uh, and you can see that uh, the amendments um, concern the procedural codes, uh, the law on international private law, or to uh, adopt a new law like a specific rules, and again, uh, to amend uh, Article 79 of the law on international private law. Uh, then uh, they are uh, different in scope of persons to which they refer. They only uh, directly only to the Russian Federation as a very uh, narrow approach uh, to eliminate, to shift uh, sovereign immunity, particularly uh, of Russia or uh, to introduce uh, exceptions to uh, jurisdictional immunity to different uh, states uh, that might be uh, determined as a state aggressor. And uh, for example, to um, eliminate uh, the immunity of the officials. Uh, so these drafts are uh, different on this point. Uh, moreover, um, these uh, draft laws are different uh, on the point of whether the act of aggression uh, committed by the foreign state uh, is to be condemned by the uh, General Assembly of United Nations and Rehovne Rada or not. Uh, two of them uh, is prescribed uh, this approach. And uh, these drafts uh, have different approaches uh, to the description of actions or omissions that resulted in shifting the jurisdictional immunity of a state. Just only uh, for uh, military aggression, armed aggression, or uh, additionally temporary occupation and other actions and omissions of a state uh, condemned by the state aggressor and its officials. So despite the general purpose, uh, these four draft laws uh, have different approaches. Uh, but uh, by this time, none of these draft law uh, has passed um, and uh, became a law as itself. Uh, and uh, during this period, a uh, very important role uh, was taken by Supreme Court, um, which in the beginning of this year uh, issued two very important judgments regarding uh, immunity 
uh, immunity uh, of the Russian Federation and how uh, the courts uh, in Ukraine uh, have to deal with this issue. And um, I tried to summarize uh, all main uh, points uh, which Supreme Court uh, stated uh, in these judgments. And first, uh, first of all, and uh, this phrase is very uh, well known among lawyers uh, in Ukraine that according to the position of Supreme Court, a court of Ukraine has the right to ignore uh, the immunity of the Russian Federation and consider the cases regarding compensation for harm caused by a physical person by the military aggression of the Russian Federation. Moreover, what is interesting that, uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, Ukraine is not a party um, any uh, immunity convention, uh, but uh, Supreme Court decided that um, it is reasonable to apply uh, the, uh, for example, Article 12 of uh, United Nations Convention uh, on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Properties uh, as a customary international law, even uh, in the circumstances when Ukraine is not uh, a party to it. Uh, then um, the next important uh, conclusion of Supreme Court is that currently there is no need and possibility to send a consent request to be a defendant in a case regarding compensation for harm to the embassy of the Russian Federation. So from this moment, uh, Ukrainian lawyers are starting thinking about uh, absence of uh, necessity to ask for consent of Russian authorities uh, to involve Russia into the case, uh, considering by the Ukrainian court. Uh, and uh, then um, Supreme Court um, stated that application of the jurisdictional immunity of the Russian Federation would deprive claimant uh, of his right for meaningful um, uh, I can see, um, see uh, deprived from uh, the right to the courts. Uh, that contradicts to the Constitution and to European Convention on Human Rights. And uh, moreover, uh, in the situation when Russian Federation uh, breached all international norms and Ukraine's uh, sovereignty and integrity, uh, she uh, breached all Corestone principles and norms of international law, uh, there is no ground to apply jurisdictional immunity of the Russian Federation in Ukraine. Uh, so these uh, positions uh, of Supreme Court in these two judgments um, play a very important role uh, for further proceedings in Ukraine against uh, Russian Federation. And uh, among, um, despite uh, the uh, approach of uh, Supreme Court, uh, there are uh, several uh, problems, several gaps, legislative gaps uh, for suing Russia in Ukraine. And uh, I divided them on three parts, jurisdictional, uh, procedural, and substantial. Uh, if we are talking about jurisdictional issue, uh, one of the uh, point uh, which really um, Judge, judges uh, of uh, commercial courts determined is uh, whether they have the jurisdiction, uh, say the commercial courts, uh, to consider the claim brought by legal entities and entrepreneurs uh, for recovery for damages uh, they suffered uh, during the war. Uh, this issue arose uh, because uh, Article 20 uh, of the Commercial Procedural Court of Ukraine uh, stated uh, states that commercial courts shall consider cases in disputes arising in connection with the conduct of economic activities. And it is clear that uh, damage caused during the war uh, by the act of uh, military aggression uh, from the Russian Federation um, out of uh, any economic activities. So uh, the first uh, issue was whether uh, commercial courts uh, of Ukraine um, are entitled to uh, have a power to consider uh, claims uh, for uh, compensation for damages. Uh, and uh, 
another question is that uh, now there is no uh, division on jurisdiction between the general court and uh, the commercial court to consider such type of claims. Uh, another problem is um, uh, how to bring uh, the legal action to which court. Uh, and uh, for example, under commercial uh, procedural court, claims for damages to property may, uh, may uh, also be uh, filed at the place of. Uh, and when uh, the dispute respects uh, concern uh, immovable assets, the exclusive jurisdiction is established. So this is the place of uh, location of such a more assets. Uh, and there is no opportunity now for business to uh, file a claim uh, in the economic proceedings at the place of their residence. And many of them uh, left uh, the uh, uh, residence uh, after the war uh, waged. And uh, this is the very important issue for them because very often assets are still placed uh, near the uh, areas of hostilities. And it is very difficult to gather evidence uh, of destructions uh, of the assets. Uh, and um, the situation is opposite uh, with the civil proceedings. Uh, uh, according to Article 28, uh, Para 17 of which um, stated uh, the possibility to file uh, such type of claims at the plaintiff's place of residence or stay. Uh, so uh, there uh, now uh, there are some problems with filing a claim to uh, commercial courts uh, by business. Uh, then uh, the very important issue uh, which uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian business and uh, people face now is uh, the issue of notification of the Russian Federation, not only uh, to ask for their con uh, consent uh, to be involved into the case, but uh, how to deliver um, the court's documents, how to notify about the hearing uh, of the case. And uh, the difficulties um, uh, uh, are connected uh, with the break of diplomatic relations between Russia and Ukraine. And now there is absolutely no any chance to deliver them to the Russian Federation Embassy because uh, it is closed now or to the Ministry of Justice of the Russian Federation. And um, um, now uh, it is discussing the, you know, um, the possibility to notify the Russian Federation through the diplomatic mission in any other country or by publishing the announcement on the official website of the court of Ukraine. Uh, but many states uh, of the world consider such notification through a diplomatic mission as an improper interference with the sovereignty of a foreign state uh, or as a violation of the immunity of the premises of diplomatic mission under Article 22 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. So the problem of notification of the Russian Federation uh, is really significant and uh, it is important uh, in, um, from the perspective of further enforcement. Uh, and uh, another problem is to provide the translation of court documents uh, into the Russian language, uh, are the language, official language of the foreign state. And uh, the last uh, type of issues, problematic issues, is substantive. Uh, how to determine and to prove the causal link between the aggression of the Russian Federation and the damage uh, caused uh, after the 24th uh, of February this year? Uh, because very often, uh, business and people just have uh, the uh, consequences, results of it, but uh, it is very difficult to determine uh, who should at this moment uh, from uh, whose side. And uh, from this point, it is very important, uh, according to my own opinion and opinion of my colleagues, uh, to amend uh, Ukrainian legislation, uh, Ukrainian law, um, and establish uh, the uh, 
uh, that uh, any damage caused during this war, uh, its source is uh, the Russian aggression and, uh, and its army. So the first reason is the full-scale war uh, waged by the Russian Federation. And the last issue is the limitation period uh, for lodging a damage claim. Uh, because according to the Ukrainian law, the general limitation period uh, is just three years, but this might be not enough to uh, submit a claim uh, on damage, uh, just because uh, it is very, as I said before, it is very difficult to gather all evidence and to uh, to prove uh, the causal link now. Uh, see, uh, the draft laws, for example, now propose to leave the limitation period uh, for this type of claims. But what is interesting that uh, uh, there is some I, I would say first or one of the first uh, Ukrainian judgment uh, on recovery for damage caused after 24th February this year uh, against Russia. And uh, it was rendered by the commercial court, even not general court, uh, but commercial court of Kharkiv region, uh, dated uh, 18 October uh, 2022. And uh, the uh, issue um, is that the historical building in the central part of Kharkiv was damaged in the beginning of March uh, as a result of the Russian missile attack. And the claimant restored the building, uh, entered into the uh, contracts for services uh, with different contractors, and brought the legal actions action for damage recovery. Uh, and uh, court, uh, the court uh, satisfied uh, the claim, uh, so the decision uh, was issued in favor of the claimant, and uh, the court relied on uh, several findings. Uh, first of all, that the fact of the military aggression of Russia against Ukraine is recognized by the General Assembly of the United Nations and International Criminal uh, court and uh, it is not required to determine uh, in the juridical uh, judicial proceeding. Then the illegality of Russian actions as a part of its aggression against Russia is a commonly known fact and established by the state on the statutory level. Uh, the course of the damage was the missile attack of the military forces of the Russian Federation, and that is proved by the written answer of the Ukraine's security service in Kharkiv region. Uh, in the top disputes, the fault of a person who has inflicted damage is presumed, and this claimant does not bear the burden of proving it unless a respondent proves otherwise. Uh, following this logic, uh, the court found all elements of the civil offense uh, that uh, it was uh, they were in place and so satisfy the claim. But uh, another uh, very important uh, aspect of this case is how uh, the court solved the immunity issue and notification issue. And uh, I would, I have to admit that uh, the court uh, didn't pay any attention to notification. Absolutely. Uh, at the same time, uh, in the previous decision, uh, in, in the order, uh, the court established um, the same elements uh, and the same arguments uh, which um, were determined into the Supreme Court uh, judgments on uh, immunity. Uh, and uh, the court came to the decision that uh, there is absolutely no any necessity to ask the Russian Federation for a consent to be a defendant in the dispute and damage uh, caused by its full scale aggression against Ukraine. Um, and uh, just uh, the last uh, point which I would like to draw your attention uh, is uh, whether the enforcement of uh, Ukrainian judgments uh, against the Russian Federation uh, is possible in Ukraine, is any, uh, is any chance. Um, in reality, uh, in Ukraine, uh, the uh, overall amount of Russian assets 
is not big. Uh, it's amount to approximately ten billion dollars. See, um, no much. Uh, assets uh, and uh, on the beginning of March and then uh, on May, uh, in May, uh, several uh, amendments to uh, Ukrainian law um, were uh, introduced and uh, due to the compulsory seizure of Russian assets introduced by this law, uh, even if the property of the Russian Federation and its key residents is confiscated by the Ukrainian state, there will be no assets remaining for enforcement of the judgments in favor of individuals who suffered from the war. Uh, see, I guess that now there is in reality, no uh, ground for uh, beliefs that uh, in Ukraine, uh, claimants suffered from this war uh, and uh, who obtained a successful uh, for them, a successful decision, court decision for them, uh, could um, obtain or could receive the compensation for these uh, damage, for these loss. So uh, we need to uh, look at possibilities to enforce Ukrainian judgments against uh, Russia abroad. And uh, that's why I think that uh, the next uh, topic uh, will be very important for us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yulia. Thank you for your detailed overview on the recent uh, case law um, on the topic uh, on sovereign immunity of Russia and Ukraine and how the Supreme Court has waived basically this uh, sovereign immunity and how um, other courts approach uh, the topic of procedural peculiarities such as notification topics, such as causal link, etc. For our international, for our foreign audience, uh, the, um, I will just uh, add that uh, Kharkiv region is the eastern region of Ukraine, east north uh, part of Ukraine, uh, where Russia uh, is providing a quite um, big uh, um, hostile aggression. So this is uh, the very east part and the damage there is quite uh, significant. Um, also, I will remind our audience that you are free to ask uh, any questions in the chat. Uh, so just to remind that we had introductory presentation from Vladislav Bandrovsky on what we are going to talk about uh, today and uh, how all these topics that we are talking about are connected between uh, each other. Yulia Atamanova um, was talking about procedural uh, issues uh, of um, uh, court claims against Russia in Ukraine and abroad. And now we are moving to our um, uh, next uh, speaker, Dmitry Donenko, who will talk about uh, the, uh, enforcement of Ukrainian court decisions uh, abroad, discussion about procedural peculiarities in Ukraine and their influence on chances of enforcement abroad. In particular, Dmitro will uh, focus on Russian assets. Are there any assets available for recovery? Uh, so, Dmitro, the floor is yours. And I remind the audience that after Dmitro, we will move to our foreign speakers and uh, ICJ and Italian court um, constitutional court decisions. So, if you have any questions about Ukrainian part, it's time to post them in the chat. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your kind invitation. And I'm very grateful and uh, I, I'm very delighted to have this chance to contribute to this fruitful discussion. Um, uh, as a brief introduction, my name is Dmitry Donenko and I'm partner with Angarda Tonist Law and have more than 15 years of experience in cross-border litigation and international arbitration. I represented the government of Ukraine in cases against Russian oligarchs. So um, I have a, I think, necessary background to speak about this very important topic. Um, the most, uh, uh, the starting point here should, uh, and I'll just underline that it's very important that not only the state, it, the state itself has immunity, 
the immunity also is applicable, the separate immunity is also applicable to the assets of the state. And if we use the UN Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities as a, uh, as a guidance here, we can see that in Article 21, uh, it enlists the types of assets that cannot be attached and executed, uh, even if uh, the jurisdictional immunity uh, was somehow uh, solved. Uh, the li this list includes uh, such types of assets like uh, embassies, the premises for embassies, accounts of embassies, military equipment, military assets, uh, cultural heritage, um, and most importantly, in uh, our case, it also includes the currency reserves of the central bank. Um, unfortunately, as the international law stands now, as a currency reserve, which forms part the biggest part of all assets currently frozen uh, are not uh, subject to execution and attachment. Unless there is a political decision of the relevant states and, and unless uh, there is a consensus that needs to be changed. Um, uh, the current proposals I, has, I have seen uh, uh, in the US, in, the, in Canada, and also in the EU, unfortunately, they do not provide for the possibility to execute and attach the currency reserve of the Russian Federation. All those proposals only concern the, private, the property of private individuals, the Russian oligarchs, but not the currency reserves. Uh, the recent statement made by the head of EU parliament also uh, a bit worried me because uh, she said that the EU is going to create a special fund and manage this fund to get certain proceeds and to use these proceeds to for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Unfortunately, uh, and I was very concerned about this statement because they are not referring to the currency reserve itself, but only for the profits, which means that there are the fruits of the investments. So it's in my view, suppose that uh, at, at least at this stage, the EU and other states are not ready to take this hard step. And I'm, as a Ukrainian, I am very hopeful that, they are, that our diplomats will be able to change the situation, but we'll see. So are there any assets that can be effectively attached and executed? Fortunately, yes, uh, the answer is positive, and we have positive examples in, in in, in, in the past, saying that it can be in principle possible. Uh, the most recent case uh, uh, I would like to invoke is a case study ASCOM versus Kazakhstan, uh, where the, the investor was able to execute arbitration award in Sweden uh, in respect of the shares of Sweden companies, which belong to the National, uh, National Sovereign Wealth Fund, which was managed by the Central Bank of, uh, of Kazakhstan. Actually, uh, this type of asset is maybe used as an example because uh, for good or for bad, the only, the only asset we can uh, currently try to find and try to use as the compensation of our damages is the commercial assets belonging to the state such as, for example, investments of the state into the private companies. Um, another, another successful example, uh, when the arbitral awards or court decision was executed against the sovereign state is a well-known Selde Myers case. Uh, effectively, uh, this uh, individual was able to execute his award against the uh, residential building in Sweden. Um, and also against the uh, premises of the trade office uh, that pre previously belonged to the Soviet Union. So again, uh, this was a commercial property, but um, in my view, this, this is a good motivation that uh, those cases are good motivation that in principle, we can expect to find those assets. That is not, uh, that is not impossible at least. Um, uh, very famous case, Yukos, is special one here because it was the largest uh, award ever. 
uh, again, the sovereign states, uh, approximately the amount of the award is 40 billion US dollars. Uh, to this date, they were not able to enforce uh, their claims, but uh, I, I would say that uh, according to the recent press reports, um, uh, there is an auction that has been prepared again for the sale of trademarks of Russian vodka Stelichne. Um, and I am very hopeful that they will be able to, to do it because uh, probably I'm a bit biased here, but I always uh, happy then when someone is, can enforce something against the Russian Federation. Um, all other they also try to attach and execute against the land plot of Russian Orthodox uh, Church against the bank uh, bank accounts of uh, Russian news agencies against debts of owned to VTB bank against uh, against uh, payments due by Air France to, to the Russian state for the uh, flights in the Russian sovereign uh, airspace. Unfortunately, those attempts were not successful, but uh, I would need to mention here that uh, uh, they were forced to withdraw their claims and their enforcement attempts due to the proceedings in, in, in the Netherlands, where probably you can you are aware that um, at that point of time, the award was set aside by the Dutch court. But later it was restored uh, by the Dutch Supreme Court. And uh, I hope that the, the enforcement efforts will continue and the enforcement um, efforts will be will serve as a good guidance for all Ukrainian companies and businesses uh, on how to get their money back, actually. Yeah, um, uh, I also would like to state that um, this is another big uh, category of Russian assets, which are the, uh, the assets owned by the state companies of Russia. Uh, here, I, I would like to refer your attention to the US jurisdiction, uh, where we have a very interesting Crystalex versus Venezuela case. Uh, in that case, uh, the again, arbitral award was enforced against Venezuelan state companies. On the ground that, um, and, and there the court actually formulated the criteria which needs to be satisfied in order to have the assets of the Russian, of not Russian, sorry, of state company attached uh, for the payment of sovereign debts. And those criteria are actually that the state company should be uh, an instru instrument of the state it, and the state should dominate in respect of the management company and should uh, and should receive the, the all the profits of this company should go also go to the state. These are criteria. Um, in my view, it will be very hard to find such kind of assets um, in case of Russia because the main Russian companies like Gazprom or Ros uh, Rosneft, they are not, uh, they are majority owned by the Russian state, but then, but there are also minority shareholders there who at least formally participate into the, uh, into the, into the management of this company and, sh and sharing the profit. Uh, however, again, it's, it is not impossible and uh, probably, uh, there should be Russian companies that can be attached in this way. And uh, I wish good luck to all in, all uh, creditors uh, in finding those assets. Uh, the last but not least category of assets are the property of Russian oligarchs. And here we have uh, a bit another problem. Uh, it is not a sovereign immunity itself, but it's rather the concept of separate legal personality, separate personality, uh, and the concept of, of corporate veil. Unfortunately, as the legislation stands now, uh, the private creditors cannot attach their assets unless they prove or cannot execute against their assets unless they prove that uh, this specific persons participated in the uh, unlawful activity in Ukraine. 
we have a good a good recent case and good example when uh, and I'm very hopeful that this case will be successful. Maybe you heard of, about it. It's Wagner case in the UK uh, when effectively the claim was brought against the owner of the private uh, uh, private company participating in the in in the, in, in the war in Ukraine. Uh, and that that's a, the uh, one of the options how to use and how to overcome this problem. Um, for others uh, and uh, for the Russian oligarchs in general, it's not the, so easy. And here we sh should probably wait for the uh, G7 governments uh, implementing the uh, legislation initiatives. Uh, uh, there is a draft. Uh, there is a law recently adopted in Canada that effectively allows confiscation of Russian oligarchs' assets. In this, that we are included into the sanctions list. Uh, there is also a draft law uh, with this, which is, has the same purpose in the US, proposed by the presidential administration. And there is also a proposal at the level of the EU. Unfortunately, th uh, those uh, proposals are not uh, perfect. Uh, again, for, uh, for me as a Ukrainian, uh, because uh, they, uh, in the majority of them only allow a confiscation of assets for a particular criminal offense, such as like participation in the corruption, money laundering, or evasion of sanctions, which is basically the, the last proposal of the EU to, to introduce uh, evasion of sanctions as a EU-wide uh, criminal offense and confiscation is a sanction for the violation of this offense. It's better than nothing. And um, I hope that uh, the special funds will be, um, uh, the money will go to the special funds that will be used to compensate, compensate damages of Ukraine and Ukrainian businesses and individuals. Um, I'm not quite sure that those assets will be available for private creditors. Uh, because um, uh, the logic behind these initiatives is that the money will go to the state budgets of the respective of the respective countries, who will then distribute this money either to help Ukrainian nationals abroad or, or to, um, to, to to help repay the damages suffered by the Ukrainians by, by the Ukrainians. Uh, but we also have a good example. From the EUS at the time of 1980s, there, there was a law adopted for the case of Iran, where um, the logic of this law was effectively that uh, the sovereign assets and the assets of, uh, in our case, of oligarchs can be used for the for the repayment of damages under the claims confirmed by the US courts. Uh, this law was never implemented because uh, later there was U.S. Iran tribunal created under the agreement between two states. But anyway, we have a precedent, and I hope that this precedent will be used for Ukraine as well. So to sum up, uh, I cannot say that it is an easy task, um, rather, the, rather the opposite, but uh, in principle, that is not impossible, and we have already have successful cases where the enforcement was was done. Um, I hope that the, there will be more successful cases soon. Uh, the choice the business Ukrainian business has now is whether to wait the, for the creation of the special commission or to try to find something themselves. Uh, I will share my my personal views here is that uh, unfortunately the creation of the commission would not be fast. Um, in history, such types, of, such types of tribunals were created either by the agreement between two states like Iran-US tribunal or by the resolution of the Security Council, like, uh, like well-known UN Claims Commission. Here we, we have no, um, uh, we, we, at least in my view, we cannot expect this to, to be done in the foreseeable future. So um, unfortunately, um, 
it will not happen in my view again uh, until the war ends and after that there will be certain times needed to create this special commission to find judges to find premises uh, then all those claims needs to be filed again to this commission then it needs to be considered by the arbitrators or judges and finally most importantly uh, as again as the UN claims commission experience proves uh, it, uh, the, the repayment of compensation would not be immediate because uh, we should face it, uh, the assets are not enough to satisfy all the demands. And in case of UN Claims Commission, there was a priorities. Uh, individuals were the, in the first priority and the companies were the last. So effectively, uh, how it works in practice, the companies were to file the claims into this commission. They have to wait until the decision is rendered, and then they had to wait until the, the money were transferred to the special funds for repayment. So unfortunately, it will not fast. Uh, maybe it's the best option now, um, but for those who do not want to, to wait, I think it, those companies and individuals can consider trying to find and enforce the decision by themselves. Thank you very much, and I hope uh, for your questions, and I hope for uh, a uh, productive discussion of this topic, because uh, I'm not here to, to, to tell the absolute truth, and I, I would welcome your views. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitro. Thank you for such a detailed overview of a case law that might be of use for Ukraine. Um, and uh, if anyone is uh, interested uh, in uh, particular cases uh, that uh, Dmitro mentioned, uh, or in general about the Russian uh, assets uh, finding and enforcement abroad, please uh, feel free to write your questions in the chat and uh, we will address them. And uh, now uh, we are moving to our um, speakers uh, from abroad, to Isabella Canata and uh, Monique Sasson. We will start from presentation um, of Isabella. And I am reminding that we are talking about how to protect uh, investments in Ukraine uh, suffered from Russian aggression. Today we are talking about enforcement of uh, um, judicial decisions abroad. Uh, we have talked about uh, Ukrainian case law, we have talked about procedural peculiarities, and we have talked about uh, case law that might be of use. But now we want to focus about uh, on two or more decisions that uh, might be um, of, the, of great use and of more use for Ukraine in uh, uh, this respect. And we will start with presentation of Isabella Canata, associate at LALIV, uh, international law firm. And Isabella will tell us about um, ICJ case on jurisdictional immunities of the state, Germany versus Italy, Greece intervening, and its enforcement in Italy. Isabella? Thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Olga. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, can you just confirm that my slides are indeed? Thank you very yes. much. Well, thank you again. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your invitation. And thanks to my co-panelists for the very, very insightful presentations. I, I learned a lot, took a lot of notes. Um, and I will now take a step back, uh, about a 10-year step back, to discuss the judgment of the International Court of Justice in the case jurisdictional immunities of the state. Um, this decision was rendered in February 2012. And so it describes public international law as it stood 10 years ago. Now, I will first of all give a histor uh, historical context and factual background to the decision and then briefly summarize the party's position and the judgment, um, notably the points that, uh, that Vladislav and also Yulia have already mentioned in their presentations, touching also very briefly on the court's findings regarding immunity from enforcement. And then finally, I will touch upon some notable um, some no notable dissenting and separate opinions on on points that we that we have discussed, and then I will leave the floor to Monique, who will then take it from there. 
Now, the historical context is uh, dates back to the Second World, World War, and it relates to the war crimes that were committed by the German Reich against Italian nationals. As a general, let's say, general introduction, so Italy did join the war, the Second World War, together with Germany as an ally of Germany, but then it surrendered to the Allied powers in 2043, and at that point it declared war on Germany. So at that point in time, part of the Italian territory was under Germany's control, and um, and Italian soldiers were combating across Europe together with uh, with the German forces. So during that time frame, from October 1943 to May 1945, so the German Reich committed several mass atrocities on Italian territory. It deported large numbers of civilians to subject them to forced labor in, uh, in, in Germany. And it also took prisoners among Italian soldiers, both in Italy, but also elsewhere in Europe. They deported them to Germany use them as forced labor and also deny them the status of, of prisoners of war under the Geneva Conventions. After the war, um, Italy and Germany entered into um, several agreements related to the, 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 the settlement of war claims, notably the peace treaty, whereby Italy actually waived on its own behalf and on behalf of its nationals, all claims against Germany and German nationals. Then later on, this agreement was, uh, was revisited slightly in two agreements signed in 1962. But again, th while these agreements provide for some, uh, some settlements, then the Italian government declared that all outstanding claims on the part of its own nationals were considered to be settled. And so, let's say, internationally speaking, this, this, uh, these conventions purported to conclude the, the, the question of uh, reparations. At the same time, um, as we are all aware, so Germany was always upfront uh, in, in recognizing the war crimes that it had committed, and it passed the law as early as in 1953 to compensate the victims of the Nazi regime. And then more recently passed a law in, in the year 2000 that, um, that was meant to grant compensation to individuals specifically, not directly, but through foundations where that would have received um, bulk compensation to then be distributed to the victims. So under this law, Italian nationals that, were, um, that had claims against Germany in relation to the facts that I summarized before, tried to um, commence litigation before German courts, and they were denied compensation, mostly because Germany did not recognize the status of these people. So mostly because Germany at that time, while it did not recognize the status of, uh, of Italian soldiers as prisoners of war at the time, it did consider that they were for the purposes of applying this compensation law, and that would disqualify these individuals from compensation. The question was also brought before the European Court of Human Rights, which denied jurisdiction on the grounds that uh, of, of Germany's in state immunity. Then, so th this, this Italian nationals then approached Italian courts, and in 1998, the first case was lodged um, before the, the first instance courts. It was a case brought by Mr. Farini, who was a civilian who was deported to Germany to, um, to be engaged in forced labor, and he demanded compensation before Italian courts. Jurisdiction was denied twice on first instance and in, on appeal, but then the highest court in Italy um, held that actually immunity in this case would not apply because the acts that the complainant was, was complaining about constituted an international crime. So in parallel, um, in Greece, something similar, some, like a similar judicial pattern had developed in relation to um, compensation from Germany in relation to a, a massacre that had happened in the same in the same time frame during the Second World War. And while um, the Greek 
appellants were able to secure a judgment, they were not able to secure enforcement in Greece because of the rules that apply in, in that applies that apply there. So they went to Italy and they obtained an exequatur of their Greek judgment before Italian courts. And then they managed to register a legal charge against German property on, on Italian territory. Now, at this point, Germany um, approached the, the ICJ and lodged a complaint against Italy for violation of public international law because of the due to the violation of Germany's immunity from jurisdiction. Um, at this point in time, Italy agreed to suspend all the proceedings, both the judicial one and the enforcement ones, pending the decision of the International Court of Justice. I have summarized the, the position of the parties uh, briefly, so it's more complex than, than in my summary, but you're invited to have a look at the, at the judgment and we can definitely discuss if you have any questions to, to develop anything specifically. So what Germany alleged is that the fact that Italian courts decided to exercise jurisdiction against them was in itself a violation of, of international law. And that also the, um, the attachment to, um, to German property on Italian territory was another violation of Italian law, of, sorry, of international law. Italy, um, Italy's position in defense was that Germany is not entitled to immunity before um, before Italian courts for two different uh, legal grounds. So one is the tort exception that um, uh, Vladislav and Yulia um, discussed already. And so Italy, it, which applies only to in relation to facts that uh, occurred on the territory of the state of jurisdiction. So in this case, Italy stated that this tort exception would apply to the facts of the case. Then the second main line of argument was that irrespective of where the violations took place, so including violations like subjecting uh, Italian citizens to forced labor, Germany would not be entitled to immunity because its acts were the most serious violations of rules of international law. And they namely violated provisions of peremptory character, so use Kogans. And also, um, there was no other means of redress available to Italian nationals. And so Italian courts rightfully exercised jurisdiction under international law. Now, the court um, unfortunately decided in favor of Germany. I say unfortunately because it's a situation that we can relate to in, in, this, in this conversation. And the, the position of Italy is probably the one that seems more interesting at this point, at least 10 years later. Um, but the court decide, decided to reject Italy's defense. And on the territorial tort principle, the, the court um, recognized the existence of this principle under international law. It is indeed enshrined in the, in the UN Convention on State Immunities, as, as I think Julia mentioned in Article 12. But this exception does not apply to personal injury or damage committed by armed forces on the territory of, of another state. Um, there is an interesting uh, con um, dissenting opinion by Judge Gaia on this point that um, ends up by saying that how is it possible that a, a grave violation of human rights is, is carved out from this exception while minor injuries, bodily injuries or injuries to property would fall under it. Then on the second point, uh, on the relationship between Jus Kogans and, and the rule of state immunity, the court stance was very clear in dividing up between substantive rules of public international law, which regulate the conduct of the states, and secondary or procedural norms of public international law that regulate the exercise of jurisdiction. So in this case, the court held that the, the rules of state immunity are procedural, and that therefore they do not bear upon the question whether the conduct in itself was lawful or unlawful. So there was no contrast of norm, let's say, between immunity and, and violations of use Kogans, and therefore immunity continued to apply. Finally, on Italy's argument that the that jurisdiction that the their 
that Italian courts exercising jurisdiction was the last resort for the victims to get compensation. Um, the court held that this was not a, a persuasive argument in terms of law, but it did recognize that it was regretful that Germany had decided to deny compensation to a vast category of, of victims. And it also invited the two states to, um, to enter into negotiations to find a solution um, to this lack of, um, of compensation. Also noting that in this context, the, whether the state has obligations to make reparation is irrespective of whether courts may or may not exercise immunity. So finally, and, and, and very quickly, because uh, this, is, uh, this has already been, uh, been explained, in relation to enforcement, the, the ICJ position is not surprising. Enforcement can only be affected against um, property that is um, dedicated to commercial acts. Any non-commercial property may not be attached. And in this case, the, the Greek judgment was, um, had been enforced against a villa on the Como Lake that was used by Germany as a cultural center, so a center of excellence and, uh, um, and cultural exchanges between, I think, the scientific communities of the two states. And that was considered to be um, pr property that would fall under um, an immunity protection from enforcement. So before um, passing the floor to Monique, I have already mentioned one dissenting, uh, one sorry, one separate opinion, and I would like to mention a couple more passages that I think are relevant to how international law may have evolved and may evolve at this point. So first of all, um, this judgment was accompanied by three separate opinions and three dissenting opinions, one of which was longer than the judgment itself. So there are several ways of, of reinterpreting the same issues through the lenses of, this, of these opinions. So one separate opinion by Judge Benuna um, related to the, to, the, to the issue whether appropriate channels of reparations were available to victims. And Judge Benuna held that it was uh, that the court had to analyze also the trend that that in, in international law, the state must make reparations. And therefore, when the state fails to do so, then national courts may exercise their jurisdiction against it to, to find another way to, to give remedies to the victims. Then this is uh, the dissenting opinion that is longer than the judgment. It's a very, very interesting read by Judge Cansado Trindade. The, and the the final um, conclusion of this opinion is that if a norm of use cogens cannot be applied because of a state immunity, of, of an immunity um, barrier, then its effectiveness is, is diminished in a way that makes, it, uh, um, that makes it illegitimate. And so the grave breaches of, of absolute prohibitions should not be covered by, by state immunity. And finally, um, the, the Judge Yusuf again discussed the issue of reparations, holding that bringing, so granting the possibility to, for victims to get reparations before national courts would actually bring international, international law of immunity closer to the protection of human rights and humanitarian law rather than constituting a breach of it. And with this, I conclude this brief overview. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabella. Thank you for uh, your overview and uh, presenting uh, this ICJ decision together with uh, historical overview on why we are talking about it and uh, speaking about also separate and dissenting opinions. Uh, before I move uh, to our next speaker, I will uh, remind that uh, we are talking about enforcement uh, of judicial decisions abroad and I will ask uh, to post your questions in the chat and uh, I mean you can 
not send it to me privately because uh, a couple of questions came just privately to me, but you can post them in a uh, general chat so everyone can see them. And uh, uh, now we are moving to Monique Sasson, uh, who is an independent uh, arbitrator uh, at um, Arbitra and uh, Monique will uh, uh, talk about Italian constitutional court view on the ICJ decision that Isabella just presented. Uh, she will um, introduce us uh, to the topic whether can the decision of Italian constitutional court in the ICJ case on jurisdictional immunities of the state be used in favor of executing against Russian property in Italy in war related cases. And she will also focus on procedural requirements for enforcement of foreign court decisions in Italy. Uh, Monique, thank you very much for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having invited me and also for all this very insightful uh, presentation. And thank you very much, Isabella, for uh, such a concise and uh, uh, deep um, uh, I mean, a presentation on the ICJ. So uh, the corner is back to Italy. I would like just to make a short note that uh, jurisdiction, sovereign immunity was absolute uh, until uh, two, probably centuries ago. And then where, where Italian courts and and Belgian courts who started uh, affirming that there is a difference between acta iure imperi and acta iure gestioni. So who knows, maybe this uh, uh, new development in the constitutional court will try to uh, introduce another carve uh, out to sovereign immunity and to the um, immunity from jurisdiction and immunity from execution in the event that the state committed a, um, a work crime or a crime against humanity. Uh, and again, I just before getting into my uh, topics, I would like to stress what Isabella just said about uh, um, Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on Immunity of States and Their Property, because that is a tort ex exception, but is a very limited tort exception and uh, cannot be considered as similar to what the uh, Constitutional Court has said here. Uh, so before going into what uh, the Constitutional Court said, I just would like to say, so my topics are two. The first is this Italian Constitutional Court dated 2014. Um, just uh, on the 2nd of December, so just last week, last Saturday, the newspaper uh, uh, reported that there is now a new uh, filing before the Constitutional Court still in this. So we'll, we'll uh, talk about this a little later. And of course, the ICJ case, there is another ICJ case, and we'll talk also about this a little later when I speak to you about what happened from 2014 onwards. There is a new ICJ case, and I see a question on that, which is pending uh, right now uh, between Italy and Germany. So the saga is still on and will be on for quite some times. And then I'll explain why, at least uh, concerning Italy and Germany. So what happened with the constitutional court decision? The, so we, in Italy, just briefly, um, the constitution, so all the judges can uh, submit to the constitutional court any issues where they think that there is a violation of the constitutional court, of the constitution, our constitution, our basic principles. So in case they see a law, and by saying a law is either an international law which has been implemented in Italy or a, a domestic law is in violation of the constitution, they can simply raise this point to the constitutional court and the constitutional court might, um, might say, yes, there is a violation or not. So in this case, what happened? The Tribunal of Florence, so after the ICJ pronouncement, um, the court were still very active in Italy. So that wasn't uh, like people didn't say, OK, so now the ICJ said, and then we stop what we're doing. Absolutely not. And there was a lot of discussion in um, the between professors and also before the courts. So um, the uh, Tribunal of Florence said uh, to the Constitutional Court, we have three laws that we think are uh, in violation 
interpretation of the constitution. So let's see what is the rule of the constitution that has been violated. And then I'll tell you about the three laws, which in any event have been already discussed. So the article of the constitution invoked here are, is article two, which protect inviolable um, uh, rights or rights uh, uh, that cannot fundamental rights of the human being and fundamental rights of a, a social collectivity, so a group of people. So this is Article 2, and just bear in mind that Article 2 speaks about everybody. So it's not only Italians, but the Constitution uh, protects, our Italian Constitution protects the rights of everybody to their um, to to have not to have violated their own fundamental rights, and then is Article Twenty Four. Article Twenty Four is of the Italian Constitution says that if you have a, a if your right has been violated, you are entitled to get a redress in court. Again, the word here used is tutti everybody. So it's not only um, of course. This is then different from the issue of uh, establishing jurisdiction in Italy. But what I'm saying here is just about what is the Constitution saying and to which type of people. So it's not a right only of Italian citizens. And there are some articles in the Constitution only which grants protects only Italian citizens. And there are articles more general. And they speak about the collectivity in general, every person. So every person, for example, lives in Italy, even if without citizenship. So the Tribunal of Florence said in that case that um, Article 10 of our constitution, which introduces automatically all the rules, the customary international uh, law rules, was violating Article 2 and Article 25 of the constitution. Then the second rule, the second law that was uh, uh, the considered in violation of Article 2 and 24 of the Italian constitution was the law that compelled that the, the law implementing the United Nations Convention. And so implement and saying basically that the judges follow the ICJ decision were compelled to decline jurisdiction because that is the result in the Italian regime, uh, in the Italian system, court system, after this, the judgment or the ICJ judgment, there is a precise obligation on the judges who are state organs, remember? So they are basically the judges is Italy. So they have to decline jurisdiction because there is sovereign immunity and because all the judges are against the state. So, um, so again, so this is also was considered by the Tribunal of Florence in violation of uh, um, the, the constitution. And then the third judgment is exactly the convention, the United Nations Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Property, which has been implemented with an Italian law. Now, the convention is not in force. I checked it today because there are only 28 ratifications. So it will enter in force with 30 ratification. But even as it stands, the Tribunal of Florence said is not covering. There is no clear exception on uh, concerning a, a cr on uh, concerning a crime against humanity, a crime, a war crime. So against Germany, it would not have uh, um, um, have. Uh, in, compel the judges to um, disregard sovereign, uh, disregard the jurisdictional immunity, because in that case, the soldier went to Germany. So the uh, war crimes didn't happen in Italy, but they ha in Italy happened so that they took the train, but the, the people were killed in Germany, so outside Italy. Um, so uh, these were the three laws that were brought to the constitutional court attention, and the court, the constitutional court, says that immunity from jurisdiction. And so the constitutional court did not say anything about immunity from execution cannot be sought. This is what the constitutional court says in 2014. The decision is number 238. Cannot be sought in the event that civil proceedings concern recovery of damages arising from crimes against humanity. So they said, we have here the immunity from jurisdiction. We understand that it's a customer international law, but this in Italy cannot be invoked by a state in the event that we speak about the civil proceedings concerning recovery of damages arising from crimes against humanity. And this is 
a clear, a clear judgment from the constitutional court. Now, why did, so I tried to summarize this, not to get into this very lengthy and detailed uh, judgment. So now, uh, why did the constitutional court say that? The constitutional court says that immunity from jurisdiction cannot protect the legitimate exercise of sovereignty that is manifested in acts Jure imperi that constituted crimes against humanity. So they said, we, with uh, um, immunity from jurisdiction, we are carving out all the acta jure gestionis. So we're talking only about acts, uh, which are acts jure imperi, because if not, we wouldn't be discussing, because the other ones are already out. Now, even if you have an act jure imperi, that if that constitutes a crime against humanity, then that is not covered because immunity from jurisdiction is not a right of the state, it's a prerogative. But in order to exercise it, you cannot have committed a crime against humanity. So the court, in relation to the laws, they said that international law, whether it is customary, where it is treaty law, cannot introduce in Italy principles that violate fundamental principles that are considered the grand norm. So I'm using Kelsen's um, vocabulary. What are the basic fundamental principles encapsulated in the Italian constitution? And so international law, no matter how it is, if it's customary, if it's treaty, cannot come in to Italy and say to us that Italian judges have to violate human rights by granting sovereign immunity. So human rights are considered under this uh, provision fundamental principles that are that are the outer limits to the introduction of international treaty and customary rules. So what happened is that it's there is a basic something here and you cannot get through. So if there is something that is trying to come in, you cannot get it in. And what the um, Italian court says, I'm not alone to say this. So there is also the European U uh, court that said exactly that because in a uh, different case, so that was a case dated, one second, um, but I think it was the 2014, sorry. I'm trying to get, I'll get that later with the details of the case. So the Constitutional Court quoted the EU court saying that international obligation cannot trump human rights. Let me just get the details because I want, I think it's C4A2. Um, it was about, I could, here it is. So it's the European Court judgment dated 3rd September 2008 in the uh, proceeding C slash 402P and 41505. So the Constitutional Court saw some light in a sense saying the EU court does exactly the same. You cannot trump uh, human rights. What happened after that? So after that, uh, the court went on and on. So and enforce what the constitutional court said because it is binding on them to say on italian judges of course to say sovereign you cannot decline you as an italian judge cannot decline jurisdiction in this case and then this went on with several contrasting judgments because some judges said well but we have the icj a but you know we have the constitutional court so we have a court of cassation sezione unite which means is the grand chambers uh, dated uh, tw 2020, and the Cassation Court is uh, 2442, uh, which says we have the Constitutional Court is clear. Italian courts have jurisdiction in the cases brought against Germany in relation to the crimes committed during Second World War. Done. So that's what the Cassation said. So the Cassation, and this is binding on the uh, court below. Then so far, all good. Germany is there, just trying to, and not because, I mean, just looking at what's happening in the Italian court, because as we said at the beginning, this is immunity from jurisdiction, not from execution. Then we have, so this was happening at the jurisdictional level, but at the execution, nothing was going through. So nothing, so the judgment were not enforced. Then the tribunal of Rome, with an order dated 12 July 2021, said for the first time that the 2014 constitutional pronouncement, it applies also to the issue of immunity from execution, which 
cannot trump human rights. So what the constitutional court said, which was only on jurisdiction, it was extended also on execution. Now, this was review in appeal, and the appellate determination reached the same result, but just held, because probably it was a scary pronouncement, this one, it held that Germany had not proved that the asset subject to execution was an asset used for public purposes. So it wasn't clear it was, whether it was one or not. However, the asset was the Goethe Institute in Rome, so it was a cultural uh, center. Then what happens with Germany, they immediately go and seek interim measures against Italy because these assets in Rome were about to be sold. So then quickly, the, the Draghi government adopts a new decree. It's a decree 36 of 30 April 2022, saying that Italy has a fund, everybody can come, and Italy will pay damages arising from judgment against Germany. People have to file those judgments within 30 days. It's applicable only to, to Italians. So the Italian citizens, it's not applicable to people who are not Italians. And then now on the 2nd of December, I haven't seen the file. Uh, I just read it on the newspaper. It says that the Roman judges said no. This cannot be that cannot be conform to what the constitution says, because the reality is that if you read that constitutional court judgment, it's so clear that the 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 core you rights of the human being are so strong that you cannot they are there you cannot try to trump them invoking other principles and so that what is pending now before the constitutional court is this so what has so the german italy germany saga was basically try to um, stop with this decree, which says Italy will pay. So all the execution will go there to Italy. And so we stop all the all the, the enforcement proceedings. So we have what we have on enforce on jurisdiction. So immunity from jurisdiction, because of course there, the constitutional court judgment stands, but we stop what happens. At least we don't sell any assets belonging to Germany. And so here we are. So we have no, um, so the saga is still going on and it's unclear in what direction. I have to say that the constitutional court judgment uh, is very strong as to protect human rights. Now, going to my second topic. So unfortunately, I cannot give you a straight answer on what will happen on enforcement, because of course, it's very good to have uh, uh, not to have immunity from, ex from uh, jurisdiction, but if you cannot enforce anything, then you are back to square one. But um, this is what is happening now. So it's all pending, it's all um, discussing. And uh, for sure, I mean, who knows what will happen at the European level, uh, although uh, it's, it's unclear. There is a precedent there, the one invoked by the um, Italian constitutional court, so we have to see. As far as the um, recognition of foreign judgment, we have the uh, our law 2018 dated the 31st of May 1995, and it's Article 64. So in case there is no, so I'm assuming there is no special international convention in this case, assuming in general, because this judgment might be uh, obtained from any court. So if they are obtained in the European Union, of course, then that's different because then they will get in much in a much uh, quicker way and there will be no assessment of jurisdiction in any of these issues. So one thing will be then to look at from the, the location of from where is the judgment coming. But let's assume the most difficult case where we don't have treaties, we don't have what we used to be the Brussels Convention. And here we have the Article 64. So the judgment rendered, and I'm reading the provision, by a foreign authority shall be recognized in Italy without requiring any further proceeding if the authority rendering the judgment had jurisdiction pursuant to the criteria of jurisdiction enforced under Italian law. So the jurisdiction will have to be reassessed in accordance to, um, to uh, Italian law. 
Then the second point is the due process point, the point that has been raised several times today, which is the defendant was properly served with the document instituting the proceeding. So when you commence proceeding, that is the document that has to be served. They need to know what's going on. Uh, and that has, to, but it has to be served at the beginning, at the commencement of the proceeding, pursuant to the law in force in the place where the proceedings were carried out. And the fundamental rights of defense were complied with. So of course, so the service of process has to be decided in accordance with the law where the proceeding with the law of situ, so where the proceeding is pending. Then the parties proceeded to the merits pursuant to the law enforcing the place where the proceedings were carried out. So the merits has been decided in accordance with the law, that is the law decided against by the law of the situs. Then the judgment become uh, final accordant again to the law enforcing the place where it was pronounced. And the judgment does not conflict with any other final judgment pronounced by an Italian court or authority. I'm sure you have heard a lot about the Italian torpedo very often. Defendants, when they know that uh, there is something pending, they try to rush here and to institute proceeding before. When they smell that there is a proceeding pending in uh, um, outside Italy that might be difficult or problematic and might be enforced in Italy, they just start proceeding here. But again, there has to be a conflict with another final judgment in Italy. And then that there is no proceeding pending before any Italian court between the same party on this end, on the same object, which was initiated before the foreign proceedings. And of course, the general provision that the judgment do not conflict with the requirement of public policy. Again, the order public here is a high um, ground. So as far as due process, you have to make sure that the due process is respected and that uh, um, the, uh, the, the service and the party had a chance to participate in the proceedings. So these are the two points. I'm happy to answer to because I saw that there are two questions maybe, but I'm not sure whether they were for this presentation or, or before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monique. Thank you for educating us uh, on this saga. Uh, it was uh, extremely interesting just uh, from, uh, you know, academic, legal, practical standpoint, but also from, um, uh, from Ukrainian standpoint. I was uh, just each and every word that you was uh, saying, I was like trying to use to Ukrainian Russia case. And I think we will come to these questions. I got some case uh, questions in private messages as well. Uh, let's um, start to address uh, questions and then we will uh, come to conclusions. Um, so the first question, I think, uh, um, from Viktor Pasichnik is uh, the following. Is there a risk that foreign courts will consider Consider the decisions of Ukrainian courts as biased and politically motivated and on this basis refuse to enforce them. Maybe I will add to this uh, question that um, in light of uh, what uh, what Yulia and uh, Vladislav said, remembering the um, decision of Ukrainian courts not to grant uh, sovereign immunity to Russia, um, is this um, decision and any procedural peculiarities that come from this decision might be overlooked or will uh, they be um, seen as uh, a risk for the enforcement? And uh, I think that this question would be good to address to Isabella and Monique, because I think uh, uh, when, I, when we were just uh, introducing uh, ourselves to each other in a preparatory call, I realized that uh, Monique and Isabella together has, have uh, more countries where they are qualified in than I <laughs> attended <laughs> this year, I think. So <laughs> uh, just uh, who wants to start, but I would be happy to uh, listen opinion of both of you. Okay, so let me start just briefly and then I'll pass the word to Isabella. So I think that uh, the issue is, for example, as far as uh, Italian courts, um, the issue of sovereign, um, sovereign immunity is uh, less. Of course, 
the re if you don't go through the um, uh, through court, for example, of the U European Union, who might be relevant for um, for any other, so for might be relevant because, for example, the person who suffered the damage moved there, and uh, as from there might uh, decide to issue proceedings. But uh, um, the the real issue that for me looks uh, dangerous is not just the general bias, but it's the due process point. So the fact that there are proceedings pendings and that somehow um, there is a difficulty in serving. The, uh, the the commencement of the proceeding on uh, the other authority that, that might look to me difficult. And of course, in this, so I find this more dangerous than the fact that we don't know where the fire is coming from. It's true. We definitely don't know where the fire is coming from, but we know who started it. So in a sense, it's like if you started it, then you take the risk that something else will happen. So this, this, this is a in broader terms. So for me, due process uh, um it's 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 a relevant issue isabella to you yes i i definitely agree with you that that at least as far as italian courts are concerned is the main issue even more prominent than the issue of uh um, of immunity from enforcement i think something else that may be considered is the um uh, the exception where a court can decide to refuse to refuse enforcement where um, the public policy norms would be violated by the judgment that is enforced. I think this is a barrier that is comes before execution in, at the exequator phase, but that's also something that might be taken into account where, for example, well, first of all, judgments were not uh, <clears throat> properly, so the proceedings were not properly served to the counterparty, but also if judgments are rendered under rules that would be considered uh, contrary to public policy in the country um, where there, where enforcement is sought. Then again, I think this, uh, the answer to this question depends on a web of uh, agreements, binational agreements on the on the enforcement of uh, of judgments, so the European Union has its own framework, and then there are several agreements binding other countries. So it will be, I think, it will be country specific, and it will be interesting to see what happens. Thank you very much, Isabella and Monica. I totally agree that uh, these uh, points, like public policy and um, due process, are uh, really essential the only thing is what uh, maybe again i am provoking here but the only thing is what i'm um, having in mind is that um, i mean in this situation where the war is ongoing where of course russia will not uh, the, the regime is still there even if the regime changes one day we still don't know whether there will be a willingness to participate in this um, uh, proceedings and to you know to respond as it shall be whether there is any opportunity on ukrainian or any other side to uh, to enforce this idea of due process and in this um, framework we have a question from uh, dmitro uh, one of our speakers uh, in your view can the notification of respondents by publication on the website i am reminding in their language in russian language be the due process point. There is currently such a practice in Ukraine in respect to Russia-related case. Um, so maybe let's start again with Monique. What do you think? So this we have also in Italy under Italian law uh, this uh, notification, but that is done only when you really cannot find uh, the person. So um, it's true that uh, I mean because the problem is that if the war is taking so long, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, because of course, because until there is the law, there is no possibility of. Uh, uh, serving mm, process there. I mean, I'm not sure whether there are, for example, other means like uh, email addresses uh, of embassies, like ICSID, for example, you always do it through email addresses. You serve the documents to embassies through email addresses or to, um, because it's true that is, uh, um, it, it's, I, I understand that the issue is definitely there. Uh, but uh, the service of process will be looked very 
um, with care in that case. So I'm not sure whether, for example, it would be possible uh, to uh, serve, uh, um, for example, even in Venezuela. So all the exit cases raised against the state of Venezuela, when at some point there were the two uh, head of states, they were able to um, serve the paper somehow to the embassy in in but not physically because I don't think that is possible uh, but uh, there must be other means that is different just from a website um, which of course under Ukrainian law even if under Ukrainian law for example is valid I'm not sure whether what Isabella said would come back as a or the public issue Isabella do you Thank you very much, Isabella. Do you want to add something on this? Uh, nothing, nothing much to add, really. Uh, I, uh, I think you were mentioning that the the need to serve through an embassy, so the the possibility to serve through an embassy abroad. I think it was Yulia who mentioned this possibility. So use a, a an embassy that is outside of Ukraine to serve process on Russia. Um, I think that might be viewed from by by foreign courts at the time of enforcement as at least an attempt to give Russia the possibility to at least know about the proceedings and then participate if. if necessary mm -hmm. um but it has to be seen because it is indeed a very specific it's, it's a very specific situation with very specific circumstances so yeah. so so i don't know to what extent we the, the foreign courts would apply very rigid standards in this case mm -hmm. thank you very much uh, i agree i i see this point uh, i also was thinking about the idea that um, it's very important to show a good will of ukraine to notify uh, their respondent and if there are really in some case no other means than this publication in russian then it's one thing and where you kind of can be a bit more creative and a, more creative than meeting your requirement of a local law, then of course uh, it will be seen as advantage. And you never know, of course, how far this creativity can reach. Uh, but uh, I think that um, even if there shall be one creative <laughs> way of notification, like through embassies abroad or etc., then uh, it can even help to, you know, to ignore the fact that due process in normal uh, view was maybe not uh, followed. So thank you very much. I think this uh, part of discussion is really very important and um, shall be uh, taken into account. Uh, then we have one more question again to, I think, uh, to start with uh, Isabella uh, from the Metro. Do you think the new ICJ case, Germany versus Italy, will change the position of Italian courts? Can it be the ground to reconsider already issued judgments in Italy? Um, thank you for your question. I think um, it's uh, there's a long way to go before this, first of all, before this, this, this second decision is reached. And then, to, you know, before we see how it is implemented into the, the Italian legal system. I think your question presupposes that the ICJ will not change its stance. And that is, I think it is something that we still have to, to check. I think everything that we have discussed today about what is happening in Ukraine in terms of how sovereign immunity of Russia is, is regarded by the law and by courts is relevant state practice for, for the ICJ. So, of course, it's probably not sufficient for a finding different than, than the 2012 one. Um, but I've just checked the calendar of submissions and uh, Italy is submitting in 2024. It's a uh, written pleading. So maybe by the time of the judgment, there will be some more significant state practice instances that the court can draw um, opinion juris and um, and practice from. So we'll see. And then uh, about the how the Italian legal system will implement this decision, maybe Monique, you have a different view? No, oh, absolutely. I agree with you. I think that um, th there is a movement to human rights and you can see with all the merchandise, for example, that is coming from China and from certain parts of China. So uh, human rights of think that were inconceivable before. Uh, if you know, there is probably half a billion uh, solar panel which are blocked <laughs> on the 
in um, somewhere and they, they are not accepted in the United States because they need clear and convincing evidence that uh, human rights were not violated there. So you never know. Uh, human rights, so 20, 10 years ago, certain things were maybe uh, different from now. Um, now it is uh, a different uh, a different regime. I mean, if you look at uh, what happens, for example, with the production of cotton and the fact that if there is a suspicion of uh, forced labor, you block the merchandise. So the human rights is very much, uh, and I mean, even at the European Union level, it's uh, the decision of 2008. I mean, it is a movement. So to say that it is irrelevant, um, I think it's it's a mistake. There is a, a completely, it's a completely different world now. And um so who knows, I'm hopeful. I think that in Italy, the constitutional court said what they said, which is very clear. And then the Italian legislator tried to put something because of course, Germany versus Italy is different. I mean, Germany paid war damages to Italy. And then the, the issue is that these people were not included in the people who received war damages, but uh, they were paid a long time ago. This is a different, completely different uh, framework. Thank you very much, Monique. Uh, we have a comment from Yulia here as well. Uh, I think it was posted during um, Monique's presentation. This type of damage caused by the war and armed conflicts does not fall into the exceptions provided by the European Convention on State Immunity of 1972 due to uh, the direct provisions of Article 31. Despite the absence of the same provision, the Uni United Nations nation convention on jurisdictional immunities of states and their property the commentators explained that they had followed the same approach because they could not state that adverse custom in the international law had a reason so absolutely this is yeah. true because uh, all damage is coming absolutely from war is a different uh, uh, is a different ball of game uh, and in fact, even if you have, I mean, here we're talking about, uh, uh, so Italy versus Germany was very different from Italy against several of officers. So one thing is the state and sovereign immunity for the state, and one thing is its own officers. So um, absolutely, I agree on that. On the other hand, I think that human rights is considered now as something that is standing alone, no matter whether there was a war or there wasn't a war. So this is what uh, uh, the constitutional court said. And I think that, uh, of course, we are speaking, we would say in Latin, the legge ferenda. So it's not uh, custom now. But this is where we can see all the trend that human rights is a standalone issue. So it's a standalone protection that no matter whether there is war or not, um, it's there. And it's an obligation for all of us, no matter whether we're in war or in peace, to make sure that uh, um, the, the human rights are protected. Mm -hmm. uh, th uh, thank you so much. May I just uh, say some, some comments? I wrote these jurors because um, in our community, it is very, very rare uh, discussed that uh, Article 12 of UN Convention uh, shouldn't be applied in these situations. See, I see that many lawyers and even judges uh, are trying to uh, base their decisions only uh, uh, or uh, in their main reason uh, on this approach as a tort exception. But I don't think that it is the right way to follow uh, because uh, there are see, uh, there is there is an explanation that uh, this article shouldn't be applied. Uh, and I totally agree that now the human rights approach should be put uh, in the first place. Uh, so um, it is not very popular now to, to discuss, but I think that uh, we, we should say true. That's why I'm really, uh, I think that uh, it is maybe earlier to bring a uh, law uh, suit in Ukraine against Russia before the uh, relevant uh, law 
um, would be passed. Uh, so uh, these changes is proceeding. Uh, these changes is uh, immunity approach should be introduced into the Ukrainian law. Uh, in this case, uh, Ukrainian judgments uh, on recovery for damage um, will uh, comply with the law, Ukrainian law, as a law of seat uh, of uh, of the court. Uh, but without these changes, now we are uh, just uh, talking about so many gaps and problems that uh, might cause problems uh, on the later stage of the execution. And that's why I think that it is really important now to proceed with passing the uh, the law implementing changes into the uh, immunity approach and proceeding uh, issues. Thank you very much, Yulia. Uh, our uh, time is run, unfortunately, but uh, if I may um, use another five minutes just for our conclusions and uh, uh, thank you all uh, part. So basically today we were talking about how to protect uh, investments that suffered from Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine. And chapter two, I remind that chapter one was devoted to European Court of Human Rights one month ago. Chapter two today, uh, was devoted to enforcement of um, uh, judicial decisions, Ukrainian judicial decisions abroad. Uh, we talked about uh, procedural peculiarities that happen in Ukraine about recent case uh, law uh, in Ukraine, but also we main, we tried to focus on how um, foreign case law and international law can help in this problem, how to enforce uh, these judicial de decisions against Russian property abroad. And uh, we really grateful to Isabella and Monique that uh, brought some, li uh, some light on, Ital on ICJ case and on Italian uh, practice in terms of this. Um, and uh, they helped us to understand um, how these cases may be of essence for Ukraine. And uh, if I just summarize in general, that even if uh, this um, Italian court decision, they were like mostly focused on Italians and German uh, on only Italians, only German property, only in Italy. Uh, they were uh, speaking about um, uh, conflict between sovereign immunity and human rights. They concluded that first thing that is relevant for us is that uh, at the end of the day, human rights uh, cannot be trumped by sovereign immunity. In essence, there, there is opportunity to make uh, an exception. And second thing, in order for Ukraine to enjoy this um, exception, we need uh, to try to show that the due process and public policy was followed. And um, due process, now we are talking even not more in um, a procedural uh, view uh, on it on under the local law, but also just to show a goodwill to follow the due process in uh, rule of law, I would say, um, understanding in general, understanding what it can be to show the willingness to follow that process in informing the other party, etc. And here I would say that uh, why this um, uh, in information and cases is important for us, because uh, the, these cases, that this saga in Italy that started 10 years ago and uh, basically concerned uh, uh, events that uh, took place in 1940s uh, might be relevant for us now. Why? Be because First of all, the situation with violation of human rights um, might be the same, or I don't know, I will not take the liberty to say whether it, it is worse now, but mm, it's just an open question for us. And uh, secondly, is that um, the world now has a chance to use legal mechanisms and case law, et cetera, to stop some violations, to prevent maybe them, because uh, um, then the aggressor might think, okay, there is opportunity to enforce. So I would say that uh, this discussion today was uh, of real essence and um, Italian uh, approach can be used 
in Italy, of course, maybe we can try to um, uh, think how we can amend it for Ukrainian situation and use it in Italy, but also worldwide, how we can create a new concept based on this um, um, experience that we just discussed and using the um, situation with war uh, with Russian war in Ukraine and uh, just to use the last minute I will thank everyone first of all uh, our speakers uh, that joined us today and spent um, amazing two hours together secondly to our audience to everyone that uh, managed to join us uh, despite uh, electricity internet and uh, safety issues in Ukraine if you can see Vla Vladislav for example is sitting in darkness for the past one hour and a half because uh, he lost uh, electricity. Uh, I would uh, also thank every uh, participant that decided to use their uh, battery <laughs> to listen to us. And of course, we will post uh, this online so um, and we will share links. So if you miss some parts, uh, it will be available to participants and just online. And also, I uh, don't want to forget to thank to Ukrainian Bar Association and our secretariat, because um, again, um, just it, it is worth mentioning, uh, Tatiana and Victoria, they joined both because they had electricity issues on both ends. Victoria was sitting in the cafe in uh, one of Ukrainian regions and uh, tried to secure a um, connection from that part. Tatiana was located in another place and Victoria just texted me that I have to leave because they asked me to leave. They're closing now and uh, they had internet and there is no other place with internet. So I really um, would like to thank everyone for your effort, your expertise, your willingness to speak about this topic. And uh, I hope to see you at our um, other events. The next event will be devoted to investment uh, treaty arbitration and it will happen in January. And about public mechanisms, we will talk in February. So thank you everyone. Just maybe each of you want to have a couple of seconds uh, to say something and then we will disconnect. I just want to thank you, thank everyone very, very much. This has been really interesting and it's incredible how you managed to put this together in the conditions that you're working in. Thank you so much. I agree. I mean, you're truly amazing and uh, your stamina is an example for all of us. Thank you. Okay, then thank you everyone. Bye and see you in our next chapters. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you.